and you are watching Selling Seattle. That's so fucking smart. Man. That was really smart. We're heading to New York City. I don't give advice that I don't take. This is the moment. How's life? Life is good, man. Yeah. Uh, we've been here for 36 hours and haven't stopped. You're from Seattle? Seattle, yeah. How's the business? Good. So I've been in real estate for 10 years, right. roughly, I think around the same time you have. Yeah. Um, I, there's only recently this year in my kind of like in expansion mode. So cool. that's a lot of some of the questions I have for you. Sure. Um, but yeah, started in the depths of 2008 and did up. But yeah. yeah. It was brutal. Um, what were you doing before? It was, I mean, this is kind of my first career. I was going to be a high school teacher. So okay. I got out of my master's program. Didn't get hired. I had to figure out what to do. And after a year and a half or so, I jumped in and got my real estate license. Okay. So that in Seattle, the market hadn't totally shifted in 2008. Sure. But in September 2008, it all hit the fan. Yeah. True. Did my first deal. And then I did one deal in nine months. Yeah. And then just like ground it out. I kind of, I'm kind of like a cockroach where I just outlasted everybody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so things are good now. And things are good now in Seattle, West Coast. Things are terrible here. Yeah, we get that. I think I mean, you'll you'll feel it in like a year or two probably. Um, it seems like New York gets hit first, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, in the financial crisis, New York stopped on that day. And the rest of the country like slowly phased out. Yeah. Actually, New York stopped like well before that, but I just wasn't in the business at that time. Um, I think there's just a lot of supply, and people are really holding onto their money. Right. So people keep putting things on the market, and there's just not enough buyers to buy. Are thing. people anticipating the the shift? Like the. I mean, I guess it's already happened, right? But it's not already happened. I mean, it's everyone's kind of worried about the slowdown. Yeah, it hasn't really, like the stock market's fine. Yeah. People are okay there, right? Like things seem to be okay, but I think people are just cautious. And so they're not really doing anything. And then there's just, it's like that cow effect, right? Like literally, we have a penthouse in Chelsea right now that two years ago we sold for 15. It's a new development, okay? So the building was in a year delay. The guy's life changed, he pulled out of the deal, he was able to rescind his contract. Okay, so let's go find somebody else. That sucks. <clears throat> now, we're probably gonna sell it for seven and a half. And one year later? To 18 months later. That's where the market is now. It's corrected in New York City, roughly about 50%, right? Which is crazy. Okay. And like even going to people yesterday on that, just saying this is a steal of an apartment. You will make money if you can hold on to it. And their responses are just like, I know, I know, I know, but isn't it crazy? All these prices are coming down. So I mean, shouldn't I just wait? Is it going to get better? Maybe I can get this for four. Like I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but you never know. Like if you'd asked me a year ago if this would go for seven and a half, I would have said you were totally insane. Yeah. You know, even then I was like ten could be crazy. So is that normal? Like that fluctuation would that be considered normal? No. It didn't even really happen in two thousand eight. Like the only people who sold where the market corrected in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, were people that had to, like they lost their jobs, they owned too much, right? They just sold and dumped and those created new comps and then the market and then it crawled up from there. Yeah. But it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like people were putting things on the market and they were just sitting. Like that's what's happening now. It's a different type of correction. Things are great. Everyone wants to make money and put it on, but the buyers just aren't there. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally different than what I'm experiencing. I know. You got the sense of it in that crowd, right? That like, yeah, everyone was asking about escalation clauses <laughs> and like yeah. average days on market being 17 days. Or like six. Oh yeah, it's, average would be yeah closer to 30 probably, but it's crazy. The good stuff sells in five days. By the end of this year, New York City. Off. That's so weird. I wish. By the end of this year, in New York City, the average days on market would probably be one year. Hmm. And everyone thinks New York City is the greatest place in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so when you started, when did you, from the get-go, how did you, what, what's your team look like right now? We're 62. Um, the majority of everyone is between Manhattan and Brooklyn. And 
is this basically just your your team? Has it's just my team. I work for a brokerage company called Messengers. I've never left because the only other option for me is to start my own thing, and it's super expensive. And brokers have lots of options, and like I'm only as good as the deals that I do. And I have great team members, but I need to feed them, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if I can do that with hundreds and hundreds of people or thousands, right. especially since there's so much competition and the market keeps changing. So I'm kind of like waiting to see what's going to happen, but. I started just with Yolanda, who's on the other side of that gray wall, as an intern, and just helping me, like manage email and stuff, and just doing rentals, and slowly just started moving up the ladder, and as I got a little bit busier, I'd add somebody else, I got a little bit busier, I'd add somebody else, but never to do what I was doing, really. Yeah. Now it's different, but at the beginning, it was always to handle business that was underneath what I wanted to be doing. Yeah. So it started with rentals, like in Korea town, and I think I talked about it in Seattle too, because right, people always ask me that question, like, I want to do $10 million deals, how do I do it? Ladder enough. Yeah, so you just work that ladder. And yeah. so I didn't want to do $2,000 a month rentals anymore, so I got Bill. Bill was brand new. He did a $2,000 a month rentals, and I would do three to 4000 And then when I got a $5,000 client, now that's all I do. Then I had to get Tatiana. She did 2000 Bill moved into the two to 3000 and I sort of started like laddering that way. It also made it easier for knowing like who to go to. And then Bill would get like a million dollar buyer at a bar. Now Bill doesn't want to do rentals anymore. He wants to do sales. He's got a little spending money in his pocket. So shit, now I gotta go get like someone else to do those deals because I never wanted to say no to money. Yeah. There's a lot of teams that just kind of are, let's say, up to ten people and still kind of do their own deals, but they're really there just for you. Yeah. You know, and they manage your clients, your business. Right. So I have like five people that are like my go-to's just for me but everybody else works on my other business and brings in their own business and they have quotas. Are you transacting yourself or are you just managing them? I've managed probably 90%, right? Because it's the safest way for me to make the most amount of money. Like I do my own deals, but I don't bank on it. You know, people come to me. It's hard to also say it that way because I do, the majority of my business is new development condo sales now. So like we have just huge projects and towers so it's like my business, because we wouldn't have it if it weren't for me. Yeah. But I have to put four people on site to sell that every day. And so I, I need them to be there. And then on the resales, I try to do it alphabetically through the team, or I do it one for one. Like someone brings in a good deal, I know I owe them next. Mm -hmm. To keep it as fair as possible. Yeah. And then I just slowly started building and building. But the power was always in leverage. Like even if I, because I wanted to make sure that I made as much money as possible even if I wasn't doing deals in this business. And I didn't want to be one of those brokers who like had a bad down month. Like we still have down months compared to other months, but they're never bad. So I still need people, you know? Um, what's your admin staff look like? I have five. So Jordan is my assistant, kind of the assistant for the office. He manages kind of the intro process for listings and for projects. <coughs> Shannon does graphic design, Kristen does graphic design, Yolanda has been with me forever. She's like my operations manager. She does everything else yeah. and kind of controls everybody as well as the team, handles all the deals and handles the closing side of listings. Okay. Um, and then I have Morgan who handles new development. And so everything on the new development front is so much work. And then everyone on the team doesn't get paid a salary, they're commissioned, and they have different splits with me based on their production. But they are kind of like assistants, you know, they they do everything on deals that I don't need to do. Because I really, really always try to make sure that I only do all day long what I can do. Yeah. You know, it's super important. Yeah. And then anything else, like doing a broker preview, doing a broker open house, going to see if that coffee shop is open, like doing paperwork, all that should be somebody else until they get to a point where they don't need to and then someone else will do it. Yeah. That's a lot leaner on the overhead thing. Yeah, I mean, how much overhead do you think do you think need? No, I'm just I know, but I, I well, I'm in agreement with you. But you have a you do a lot more business than I do, and you have um, I don't know someone else. I, I don't know how many admin I expected. I guess what I'm saying is it's cool for me. For in New York, I have a lot. Like most teams, just have like one assistant, oh, yeah. right? But then they have brokerages that have all these people. Like yeah. I don't go to messengers for anything. I have my own accountants, my own bookkeepers, and I guess I have more admin staff. We have a showing coordinator named Renee. We also have Jasper, <coughs> who does all of our writing for us. We have Videographer. videographers, right? We have all those people who do that kind of stuff. But I also put a lot of onus on the individual team members. Like, 
anytime a team member comes and says, like, they didn't do one thing that is on, like, the checklist protocol that we have for everything that we do, then they can no longer be here. Like, you have to just do your job, right? It's very important to me, and nothing is beneath anybody. So there's a lot of companies, too, and teams that have more admin, but then it's like, it's almost like out of laziness, and I really want to control overhead as much as possible, because that's where a lot of brokers just fall, right? Their overhead is just too high, right? This isn't that hard, it's just real estate. Right, right. When a lot of it can be checklisted, right? For yeah, so we have, we have uh, list, new listing protocol, new agent protocol, we have new development protocol that is super checklisted for like the most standard of deals. Obviously things change yeah. and people can improvise, but so everyone knows what they're supposed to do. A new listing comes in, this is what we do. A new buyer comes in, this is what we do. This yeah. is how we do it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so what's the next year hope for you? More. I don't know, I want to open another office in Brooklyn. Um, Brooklyn is the greatest market for me anyway, right? It kind of like be, like if I was in San Francisco, I'd be really focused on Oakland, you know? Yeah. Um, because it actually sells. Like, I don't really care about what I sell as long as I sell. I don't really want to do like bullshit stuff either, but I want to do things that sell. If I get super excited about every two or three family house I sell in Bed-Stuy and Bushwick, Right? I get more excited about those as long as I do them in volume than I do about a $20 million condo in Soho. Yeah. Like, it's great, it's good deals, they're good paydays, but they're a pain in the ass. You're dealing with people who are kings of the universe. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all about volume for me. Like last year we did 500 transactions, give or take. Right? Um, and a lot of other teams did a lot less. Some people sold more, but they, like just a headache. You know, they want their headache, they want the volume. Uh, the agents you bring on, are they experienced or are you training? I mean, it's a mix. So we have an apprentice program here too, okay. where brand new agents, well, all new agents have to go, there's like a three-step interview process. The first is through me, but I've learned over time that I, I seem to like everybody. <laughs> and everyone's super nice to me, and I'm like, they're great. Then they have to get through another agent on the team, right? Someone else random, because I'm not here that often. And so Jen or Cameron or Brian, have to want them in this room too. Um, and then they have to go through Jordan and Yolanda. If they get through all those people, then we can figure out a deal that makes sense. And if they're brand new, they have to team up with somebody else in the team for their first five deals, Yeah. right? Which, as you and I both know, can take some time, right? Right. Yeah, totally. But that's also a good way for them to learn where they're also not just like sitting here. You have production goals for the new, yeah, the new people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I can, I have to contextualize it, but. It's random. Um, everyone's a little bit different, right? They gotta do their first five deals within six months. It's kind of like, kind of the benchmark. And it could be rentals or sales. Most of the times they do it quicker, but sometimes they don't, you know? And then we'll reassess. Um, but once you've been here for a year, or after those first six months, then we set up an annual income goal that they personally set with me. I sit down with everyone. But I sit down and I basically say how much money you want to make next year. You can't make less than you did last year. It has to be more. If it's fifty thousand more, if it's hundred, whatever it is, and kind of see where they're going, and then you have to hit it. And we figure out how you're gonna do it based on how much you need to sell, based on like average splits and average commissions, and then that's kind of like your salary. Anything you sell over that, make over that is kind of like your bonus that way. Yeah. And then adjust and adjust. And if you can't hit the income goal that you set yourself. And if you didn't come and talk to me in June or July, then you can't be here. You started Bravo early on, right? We started in 2010. <clears throat> the show didn't come out until 2012. So I was in the business for four years when the show actually came out. So what I'm getting at is how do you, like you have people that want, like are clamoring to be here because of your status, right? So like, how do you um... get people otherwise? Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't think, What's the value add if you're not on? So I don't. For me, basically. Yeah, sure. The show, honestly, that's where I made mistakes early on, was bringing people in who just really wanted to work here, but then they sucked. Like just because I'm on TV doesn't mean that they're going to be good real estate agents. Right. For the most part, they're here for the wrong reason, right? And so everybody who actually works here now are people, for the most part, that I had to go find, and I had to find in different ways. So I mean, the best agents that I have were not in real estate; they were newer. 
and I don't like teaching old dogs new tricks. Mm -hmm. So like really experienced agents, they want too much, they do too much, their personal lives get too in the way, I don't want to deal with it. So, you know, Chase does a considerable amount of business. I found him selling t-shirts. Cameron is at a closing right now for $32 million for a guy that founded Facebook. And he was selling furniture to the tech community, right? Um, Roy was selling like Iranian handbags, but these people were really good salespeople. Yeah. And it's like, you can make a lot more money in sales. Why don't you come and do this? and put them into the apprentice program and they like it and some start part-time, some start full-time um, and kind of mix and match that way. Cool. But I think that like if I'm you, you know, you use a 10-year track record and you use the ability to learn and not just be by yourself. Like I wouldn't focus on agents that, like a great model of how a team should work. And I know you're from Seattle, okay? So don't get upset. Is <laughs> the Patriots, yeah. right? Think about like a football team. Think about a football team that literally will spend no money on quality talent. Right. All of their top players, with the exception of that quarterback, are like Chris Hogan, who's one of the greatest wide receivers ever, played lacrosse. And they were like, you should play football. And now he plays football. And he's really, really great. Like they find people and then they nurture the talent. So then the talent doesn't want to leave. And then the Patriots have given the talent this amazing lifestyle and opportunity, and then they kind of want to keep giving back. Like that's the best way. And it's hard at the beginning. Or if they get too big headed, they kind of lose. Right? Of course, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's like thanks so much. I got some of the best years out of you. Go get hurt in someone else's team. Right. Right. So that's kind of what <laughs> happens here. Right. You know, like and like try to keep everyone's egos in check as much as possible. But the best agents are the ones whose lifestyle changes while they're here. You know, and really focusing on not to say that I don't want like good people, but like if I open another office in Brooklyn, I'll have a manager who knows what they're doing, but then I'll hire all fresh faces and new people who are incredibly hard workers, right? Who have did I talk about the four E's when I was in Seattle? Mm, I don't remember for hiring new people, no. right? <clears throat> it's energy is the most important thing in the whole world, yeah. Like they have to have good energy in the room, and like if they don't have good energy, then they're gonna walk in like sloths every day yeah. and there'll be they'll never be able to pick up the phone you know energy they gotta have enthusiasm like they have to be excited even when they're not making money yeah. like they have to be excited about life and you can figure that out based on like how they tell a story like if they went to a concert and they're like yeah i went to a concert not good they went to like a fucking awesome concert it was great and they were singing and you can follow them on social media and you can see that they're excited about life that's great that's what you want uh they need to have empathy okay? and you do that by asking them Tell me about the worst time in your life. It's a great question to ask. If they tell you, uh, my mom died, that person has no empathy. But if they tell you, well, when I was 10, my mom got sick, and they walk you through that process, that person can talk to someone about tough situations, and that's what you need. And then the fourth E, which is kind of a little E, is education. Like, is what? If they can speak and they can write, they don't really care if they went to school. It helps, obviously. If they know the market, if they know the business, that helps but we can teach them anyway. Yeah. And then it's about spending like the time. The hardest part about having people is taking time to spend with them, to train them in like your ways. It's a big part about you know, why, how the book came about. Because I was just writing like my agent playbook for yeah. my team. And then I was like, maybe I adapt this, flush it out, make it like a real book. But like, this is now my training manual. <laughs> Like, you have to read this, report back to me, it'll save me time, and then we'll sit down and go through it. This is everything that I know about how to sell and how to build a sales career. So, percentage breakdown, how much are you managing those people of your time, percentage of your time? Managing the people is very little, honestly. You're saying spending time that takes, or oh, spending at time the beginning. Takes, oh, gotcha. At the beginning, at the beginning, at the beginning. Um, Everyone's different, you know? There are some people want to sit down with me for a half an hour every week. I don't want to do that. Some people I see once a month, but they do deals and they just don't like being in the office, you know? So the time that I have to manage is a lot less compared to them. Like that's what Yolanda and Jordan are here for. But I answer all their phone calls, I talk to them all the time. It's a lot, but I try to, I would say 90% of my day, like 95% of my day is bringing in business 
that's like that is my through line. That's all my cares. No, not necessarily. I hope I, I try, but it's either pitching new listings, reaching out to people to try to get business, going to meet developers, going to you know, even doing like the Chase speaking events, trying to meet other brokers that are good referral sources for me. Like that's also a big part of me doing that. Shooting the shows takes a significant amount of time, but that's branding for me to be out there that my team can't do. Like I need to be quarterbacking me as much as possible all day long so that we all have more business to do. So we were at Bader yesterday. Yeah. Doing, I don't know if you know about the 4Ds. I don't. Have. What is that? Uh, it's a one-day intensive where you get to sit down with, I don't know, I don't know how many sessions, we had eight sessions. Yesterday? Yeah. Crazy. It was nine hours. How much was it? 10K. What? How many people were there? Nine or 10. Okay. Um, so. Is it for all businesses or what is yeah. it? So we had a real estate agent. We had, um, Two guys, former NFL player that's launching an app in September. Um, we had a DIY flower making kit company. Um, we had a VC in the room. We, and there's, we're the camera. How often does he do that? I think roughly twice a month. Crazy. So you get, Gary's in the room for an hour and a half for Q&A, which is cool, because he's just like sitting at this table. Yeah, yeah. Chopping it up with him. Um, how did you find out about it? Did you post about it on social or? Mm -hmm. Well, it was cool. We actually kind of, we were talking about ad buying. So you know, they break it down, like they bring in the, the head Facebook ad or social ad buyer um, for the company. And they're just going through their playbook of like, here's what you look for, here's what you do. If you only have $100 to spend, this is where you focus. If you have 100000 here's what you do. Do their sales funnel. And we broke that down. It's kind of funny to be like, oh yeah, okay. I, Heard about it on the podcast, clicked on the website, you hit me up for three months on Facebook about it. Because of that information, right? Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. But, I mean, I was already sold from the moment I heard about it. But anyway, the point is, um, it's a huge inspiration for us. Things I already kind of knew and had seen and saw you, even though you're on TV, you're starting to vlog. Um, and talking to Gary about, basically, it's just like a land grab at the moment. Yeah, he uses that phrase a lot. Yeah. And so, curious what your, you've been in it for four months or five months or something like that? Yeah. What's the, what have you seen? We keep laughing at it, but yesterday, after having a lot of things confirmed, I get a call from, I, I don't do new development in Seattle. Um, it's a little bit different, right? But uh, I got a call from a builder saying, hey, I see your stuff. Can we have a conversation about what we can do together? And that's like only from, how long have we been posting? A month? Yeah. Month. So we're just laughing, like, who knows what that turns into, but like that's our phone call, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so how's how's your business shifted? Ultimate motivation, because you have in the real estate world, you have a top five to ten um, attention span, right? Sure. Eyeballs. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it hasn't really shifted at all. It takes time. Right, and I'm still feeling it out. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not, it's not hard for me because they just sort of follow me as I do what I do, put it together. It's I honestly started it because I saw that people were not watching TV anymore, and I wanted to hedge my bets. It's my hedge against TV. It's really what it is. It's that I built my business while Million Dollar Listing has been on the air for millions of people. Less and less people now watch TV. No one who sits here has cable anymore. When I first got into business, everyone had cable. Cable. They watch on the internet, they watch on their phone, they watch Netflix, Hulu, they don't watch cable. You can't watch the Nindar listing unless you sign in on BravoTV.com with your cable subscription. I want to, like you said, like the land grab, I want to already have a presence out there so I don't have to start from zero right? and let people know about it. And so you now I have developers who, for me, just think it's funny. Like, and for me, they just think I'm incredibly vain. Like, you have two TV shows and you, you had to do a vlog too. <laughs> like, can't you leave room for somebody else? Um, but where it really helps me, honestly, is in the speaking side. Right? Speaking is like small income, but it's it's beneficial for me to do it. And I get a lot more speaking engagements from the vlog than I ever do from TV. Interesting. Yeah. Because people see like the TV member. Yeah. Right. 
Um, but the, the speaking, like keynotes, panels, and stuff like that around mostly for sales conferences, mostly for, like I'm not like somebody who can just go to some random event and talk about life and entrepreneurship in general, right? Right. And I guess it can, but I think I'm most effective in front of salespeople and brokers around the You're world. You're the agent 2020? 2020? Right. Tell me about real estate. Yeah. You know? Um, and so it's, it's worked that way. It's fun. It's different. It's just another form of content to put out there. And like, you need to be in as many different places as you can. Are you doing your social yourself? Uh, I mean, I post myself, but I do have two people that help me who, I don't do anything for Sir and Team on social, they handle all that stuff, like uh, no time. But Joe and Casey, they help with kind of all that back end social media stuff and like help guide it and like they're helping with the app and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I made a game, it actually comes out today. Sweet. I have not posted it at all yet, but it's a real estate game where you play as a, uh, you play as a young rental agent in New York City, and <laughs> like Candy Crush kind of. All right. Or, uh, no, it's more. It's like uh, around the city. Not yet. We're we're getting there. It's so expensive to build like a real New York City. It's like I can't afford that. Uh, so it hasn't come out yet, but it comes out eventually, at some point today. And it's what's it called? Agent Empire. Um, but you play as a real estate agent in New York City and you run around and you do deals and you negotiate and you build and try to make money and you have to fight other brokers to get listings and we'll see how it goes. I always kind of wanted to do like a role playing game, something like that. Um, and so it'll be fun. Cool. Yeah. You got that book, the vlog, the TV shows. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, what aren't I doing? Podcast. You have a podcast. So we did a pilot podcast last week with iHeartRadio. Like we we tried here, like I don't want to be emailing people to like interview them and do all this stuff. We'll do audio by the end of the year, um, but we'll do it like in seasons, like not every day, right, or not every week. Um, but we'll do it like in seasons, like twelve episodes at a time. I think what we'll probably do is more kind of like my own story, sort of like the rags to riches type thing, right, from nothing to something, yeah. and then just find people who kind of have the same sort of story and see kind of like how they did it you know why don't you strip the vlog audio we've thought about it in the past and i tell them to do it they just haven't done it yet i don't know there's, there's only so much we can do um but you're right they should do that that's what gary told us to do um like the first time i, I ever met him that was one of your first episodes right yeah yeah early on and then the vlog it's like trying to figure out it's like the same issue we have with million dollar listing like been doing it for seven years now, you know? Like, we're, we're gonna start shooting in our listing season eight. Like, there are only so many ways you can sell a property on TV. Yeah. And only so many times I can, like, talk to someone on speakerphone on the street, you know? And only so many ways I can negotiate. And, like, how do you keep it fresh and keep it different? And what you see now in this season is, like, it used to be that Bravo only wanted to see, like, things that we sell. So we would shoot properties, and if we couldn't sell them, they would only end up editing and putting together things that sold. Yeah. They wanted like wins and awesome and New York and crazy. Well, now people love seeing the big commission numbers come across the screen. They used to. Oh, they don't like it anymore? People don't like it anymore. Like the world has changed. They like turn the TV off seeing There's, like, like three now. people in New York City making money. Like now, if you see this season, like even last week's episode, it's like pure crushing, like a, it, the worst day ever. Like you losing projects, losing listings. We've never done it before, but this season we're doing it where they follow us on listing pitches like they always have. But if we didn't get it, they would scrap it. Now they're putting it in the show and they're telling us later, and they're like, you know, that house that I was going to get on 76th Street for like 17 million bucks, she called me and said she was going with somebody else. And they put that whole thing in the show and they're like, no, it's good. That's what people want to see. They want to see you lose now. <laughs> like life has changed that way. It's like, it's crazy, mm. you know? So. I don't know, just trying to say as different as possible. Okay, cool. Yeah. But I would find young people, right? Young people who can work underneath you who are grateful to be there. Mm -hmm. Like you want people that work for you to be grateful and then watch them grow. And then, you're, then, you're, then you do that classic, just promote from within. Yeah. Like people that work with me now who do the big projects with me, they started with me from the bottom. And it takes time, but then those people don't leave. The only reason they leave is if they don't make money. So then you have to like nurture them and help feed them and right. give them 10% on this deal, give them a couple hundred bucks for doing this open house. 
like you have to take care of them so you don't want to grow too fast right but that's how you hedge against like and then you yourself can go and focus on bigger things i think that's the the challenge for me is that until for the first nine years i just kind of worked my database yeah right family friends i wasn't doing a ton of outward bound marketing sure so as we skip kind of as we scale with our visibility hopefully i can feed like right now i can just feed a the other person besides Dylan is um, uh, uh, Blakeney, and she's kind of half executive assistant, half buyer's agent. Sure. Um, and you know, I th I would even love to send her more business, but uh, so working on the pipeline basically to be able to feed a bunch of people. Sure. Or more people. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, I also too like the the managing training or the training aspect. Is a little daunting, and so I also have three kids at home. And um, three, how old are you? 35. Damn, I'm working on my first. Keep you posted. <laughs> yeah. Nothing to announce. No, no, it's awesome. It's like the best, it's the best um, priority shift a yeah. bit, you know. And so, like, you, I want to go home at night yeah, and not sure. like work and train. And um, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time, you know. It's it's smart training too. Like I would start with one person at a time, right? You don't need to have like 50 people, but one person at a time and just have them shadow you at the beginning. That's kind of what I did at the beginning too. I'd have them shadow me. They'd come with me everywhere. And then slowly but surely you realize like, oh, they're not shadowing me anymore. I guess they're doing other stuff. Oh yeah, that's, they're working on that deal, taking that person. Yeah. Now I have more time, new person, come shadow me. Yeah. And just create that shadow and then that way you're, you're not taking extra time on top of the day to sit here and train them. You're training them in between appointments, you're in the car, they're asking you questions, you're talking to them. And as long as they have good energy and are super enthusiastic, they will hammer you with stuff. And they'd rather, like you've been in the business for 10 years. How awesome would it be if I'm a brand new real estate agent who like, you know, I thought I was gonna go to law school, but now I can't, or you know, my life changed and I really wanna do this business and I love it to be with you every day versus just being by myself or working by myself somewhere else or like working on a team that's really established where I'm just like the lowest rung of the totem pole. Like that's that's an opportunity I think people would soak up. Right. Yeah. Right. It's Joe. What's hey. up, Joe and Phil? Joe. But it's nice one you. listing agreement nice Joe. instead of nice 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 200, right? Yeah. No, it's not set to be. So if, I don't sell the, if I don't sell the units, I don't get paid. So what does a developer want? Like what are they looking for? In marketing exposure, complete staffing, advertising, everything. And so are they coming to you in part because of like your celebrity status? They used to. You know, now it's more um, because we're a better deal than the bigger firms. Like I started, even with Million Dollar Listing, I was like 24 or 25 on a Bravo TV show. Like yeah. New York City real estate developers didn't want to hire Ryan Serhant takes his pants off on a reality TV show, I had to show value. So I had to show that I was smarter than everyone else and I would do it for a better deal. Everyone else is charging 3%, I'll do it for two. You know, and not everyone would say yes, but enough were like, okay, give you 30 days. And then I would just hump it until I kept it and sold it out and then I would use that to go and get the next three projects over and over and over. I know too many brokers are too commission sensitive. And they're like, well, I'm not a discount broker. Like, Asshole. Like, commissions are not in the Bible. Like, we, we made these up. Right. If we could take 10%, we would. Like, and Nest Seekers obviously doesn't care about that. No. No. Nest Seekers, like, I'd rather make $1 than make $0. So, especially at the beginning, you know, it was very important for me to get as much business as possible because the business would speak for itself. Yeah. And I was never going to lose a deal based on commission. I would always do it for cheaper because who was I? Yeah, you know. We were talking about Facebook. Have you know the Facebook guy, social guy? Here and there. Yeah. Social Joe. Social Joe. <laughs> Day one. Well, we were just at um, Vayner Media talking like all things social media yesterday. Uh -huh. So we're curious specifically to real estate, like how you, if you do any ad buying, that sort of thing. We do them case by case. Um, I see them as they work better with, uh, I would say, new developments because there are more units, right? So if you have a building with like 50 units, it's easier to market something bigger than yeah. as, as opposed to like, a, like one specific townhouse in Chelsea. Right. Um, but we do kind of everything that, you know, Gary would say to do, right? Income threshold, 
types of jobs, types of companies. Um, but like I said, I like I think there's more success when there's an actual building as opposed to one particular place. Yeah. It's really really hard to to market one specific property. Yeah, it's expensive. It's expensive. It, it works, but it's a lot of money. For the for the new developments, are they? Do you get a budget from the builder on your marketing, or is that just out of your commission? Every every project is different. If it's huge, then yes. You know, we have some projects where it's like ten thousand a month. Others, it's more. Others, I get the project, and we have to take care of everything. And then I said to be super smart. You just front it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it depends, though. You know, but it's also like what I hate doing is spending money on marketing for something that is not going to sell, or something that's overpriced. You know, like we don't have your market. Our average days on market is so long, and not everything sells. There's, I don't know, it's like 50,000 homes on the market in New York. Only 11,000 will sell in a year. There's so much that will never sell. Do you pre sell condos? You try. You used to be able to, now we can't. People don't buy a floor plan anymore. There's too much active inventory, like the $15 million penthouse that'll sell for seven and a half. Yeah. Like, why would you buy that? pre-market two years ago and overpay, you know? Unless it's super special and super, super unique, then people will jump on that stuff. Yeah. You know, New York City's all about light and air, so people will pre-buy things that have good light, good views. Everything else will sit and wait. Because if you look across the street into another building, there's lots of those. It doesn't matter how nice they are on the inside. Yeah. So for new development, you're doing like the conceptual plan for how you're going to tackle it or what is I guess what do you what do you do social Joe what do I do social Joe so I mean it's a team of three or four now right so we have Adam who shoots everything with Adrian um, they both edit um, and I kind of run the entire process we also have a side company called SMG which where what do you guys do or that's you it's right here um, and that little desk right there um, so we're working on a couple pilots there but in terms of specifically to Ryan and the Surrogate team, just like every single platform. Um, we're up in content right now. We're at, we're at one video a week on YouTube. Adam's gonna kill me for saying this, but we wanna ramp up to two. Um, we do have LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. You know, okay, across all platforms, how many posts per day? Um, one. One, one, one to one three. There's always one on the Surrogate team, usually, yeah. especially during weekdays. And then you're usually posting at least one piece of content a day for the yeah. most part, whether it's a photo or a video. But or not. Cool. Well, for real estate specifically, it's you know <coughs> it's different. We'll I think your question is more like so we'll like we'll figure out who the target demo is and we can go after those people through like the Facebook backend pixels and all that stuff. I don't know. But you can figure out like let's just target people eighteen to thirty five because this is a first time buyer market. Yeah. Let's go after people who are talking about schools all the time because we think these are three bedrooms that need kids and all that. Yeah. Um, you just try to spend you know, wisely, but New York is, listen, New York is also different. Like people still check their mail here and direct mail gets us more leads than Facebook will every day. Interesting. Right? Because direct mail, they actually have to look at it, decide to throw it away. Whereas Facebook, you spend all that money and they're like, meh, 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 and like they already went by. So like you have to really, like the best targeted ads that we do on Facebook are kind of like what you, did for Vayner, like you were talking about, right? You saw on his social that he's doing the 4Ds program. You went to his website, made you go to the website, they tracked your information forever, and then they started targeting you for three months, like you said, right? So that's the best way to do it. Once someone sees a listing, you can target them forever until they show up. Okay. Yeah, or you, the other thing that we'll do, especially for projects, and like if this builder has a project like that, what really works and you can talk about is you um, you do competitor promotion where you just advertise against other projects. So you say, who's my comp? You advertise against those listings and against those projects. So for every project we have, there's 10 other buildings that are competitors. We make sure whenever anybody is looking at those or typing it in or sees one of those ads, they also see us. It's the easiest way to do it because then you can, you don't even have to go after demographics, let them spend all that money. You just go after and you're like, you become like the ambulance chaser of, of advertising, but it works so much better and it's more cost effective. Basically part of the like video promotion team. Um, everything, just the entire media team. Right, I would say brand awareness in general. It's just as many people who know Ryan's self better. Yeah. Uh, 
especially in New York, the luxury market, and have a million dollar listings, like automatically triggers, okay, I'm gonna buy a property that's four million dollars, where do I even start? Yeah. And they've most likely seen the show or seen like, clips of the show or something like that. And they're like, okay, let me dive a little deeper. And then they go to his Instagram and they see he's actually putting content about the properties that he's selling and all that kind of stuff. So it all adds up into one general awareness bubble where I think we get the most benefit. Yeah. I mean, real estate in general is really just exposure, right? Yeah. Obviously, hard work, just everything that Ryan does, but that's mainly our job. Just, as I just said, brand awareness, just figure out ways to continue growing eyes on Ryan, on the brand itself, on the team, and just new opportunities that make sense. Right? And being different than everyone else. Like, I don't know if you've seen Ryan's Instagram where he does those little motion graphic videos where there's like a bunch of his heads popping out of the windows of the property or mm -hmm. things like that. Just finding creators or creative people who can spin things in different ways that, that will actually like grab somebody's attention, especially on mobile when everyone's always just scrolling through. Do you guys do that or do you outsource that? Well, yeah, if we, we can't do it, we outsource yeah, it. Yeah. We try to do it, but we have other videographers who like specialize in yeah. just crazy stuff like that. Yeah. But to be different, just to be different, but I would, you know, we focus a lot more on getting new business than we do with promoting what right. we actually have. Right. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm you, I'm making sure that people that really want business from see my stuff all the time. Like you know who they are, you know their names, you know where they live. Like target market those people. Like you wanna be like that pipeline machine to bring things in. Yeah. Especially in a market where the average days on market is like seventeen days. If you price it right, it's gonna sell. Right. You know? Good to meet you. I bet you it was good meeting you. Yeah, I tested you. Nice call. See you around. Hey, it's good meeting you. Nice meeting you. Do some push ups before. I'm gonna try. Yeah. Um, okay, so from your perspective, how's how's the vlog going, and what does he what does he need to do? What are you trying to get him to do that he's not doing? Uh, good oh, question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's tough because he's so busy and he has a lot of things that we can't film. So it's just a matter of on both of our ends of just trying to utilize the time that we have to shoot, whether that's just talking about different things or like talking about college debt or moving to New York on a whim or something like that, just to um, just to like expand horizons a little bit, but I mean, we're the YouTube's awesome. I think it gives people like a connection that they're not really used to, especially because they're used to seeing him on TV or, or an Instagram story. It's more of like a long form. You get to really see someone's personality and how they like go about their day or go about their interactions with others. Yeah. Vlogging's awesome because you can literally see in real time like how one human being reacts to another one and, and how they react to what they're saying and, and especially in sales because it's so incredibly important. Right. So, um, I think you, have, Brian, you probably learn a lot from just watching yourself. Yeah, and you listen, you, it was, Gary also talks about it a lot, right? But it's um, uh, like, we go back and forth on figuring out stuff that we think is important to put out there and stuff that's, that'll work for the audience, right? Like on Instagram, if it's with me and my wife, that's what people want to see. Everything else is like half that. Even if I look here, like on the vlog, you know, it's selling a $9 million penthouse over FaceTime was 222,000 views, okay? People wanted to see that. 21 questions with Larry King, I thought was super cool, let's put that out there, 24,000. Literally 200,000 less people gave a shit about that. Well, YouTube people probably don't know who Larry King is. True. Also, I mean, but it's also a name, you know, my nine to five as a real estate agent, we thought was super cool and different. Maybe people would understand that one, 47,000, you know, so it's all over the place. And then, I don't know, what's it? Why real estate's the greatest career in the world. That one happens to be 171,000. So it's like, it's all over the place. I think the greatest benefit we got off YouTube was com a completely different audience from what yeah. any other social channel that Ryan's had. No one who watches my YouTube channel, I think, four people have ever seen Million Dollar Listing. Mm -hmm. Maybe they saw it on a plane or they've heard of it, but other than that, it's um, it's a demographic and age group that no longer has cable, which again, like I told you, right, is my hedge against TV going under. It's pretty it's pretty astonishing actually, because you, you can even look at, and especially his analytics, it says that a lot of his older audience is on Instagram, and then when you look at YouTube, it's like everyone is 18 to 24, males, females, people, who want to know about real estate or want to know about like just the business environment yep. and like just seeing somebody who's pretty successful walk, run around New York City doing 
like going about his day. People really want to see that kind of stuff. So, yeah. and then we get stopped by like young people on the street saying like, "Dude, what's your vlog?" And if I said, "Oh, you're not million dollar listing," they'd be like, "What's that?" <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's, it, you like know, that thing my mom watches, that thing my dad watches, my grandfather loves that show. <laughs> well, it's almost like, you know, like Will Smith, I sad to say, like he was almost like irrelevant until he like launched his Instagram and his vlog and stuff. Yeah. And now he's like on fire, right? Yeah. Um, so he's out there. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I don't have Will Smith's um, <laughs> yeah. just yet. <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, it's different. But listen, I, no, but it's the same thing, right? We're like, he's tapped into a new audience that he never had before. Sure. Yeah, and people are pitching onto it. But like, how many people watch Will Smith versus how many people watch PewDiePie play a video game? The people who watch our vlog now, a lot of them weren't, like, they don't know the past century. Like they were born in the year 2000 and over. Like that's insane, <laughs> it's crazy. Like it's so crazy. Um, so it's different, you know, and you have to adapt, you have to change, you have to figure it out. So, so when's the Twitch studio getting built? Dude, I don't have time. <laughs> um, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll just try to do as much as possible and see what sticks. You know, kind of like anything, like any business. Like not everything is going to work out. Um, the good thing is that social media, for the most part, is relatively free. Mm -hmm. Right? They just steal all our information. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. What else? Um, we talked expansion, we talked team building, we talked social vlog. You fly back today? We fly back today. Nice. Tonight. Oh, what should we do? We got like three hours to kill. I don't know, should we go around the city yet? We walked the High Line last night. We were staying in Chelsea. Cool, where? Uh, Maritime? Yeah, you know, this really fancy hotel called the Double Tree. Oh, nice. <laughs> Good work. Um, and we ate in Chelsea, we ate in Greenwich last night. That's cool. Um, have you, what was that time you were in New York? Two years ago. Just basically, I was here for Inman. Okay. So I'm just kind of hung around Times Square. Did you ever go to the Freedom Tower and see the pools and stuff? No. Okay, well, I mean, that's in America. Is that the new World Trade Center? Yeah, you have to go there. Okay. You have to go. Just take Broadway all the way down to Wall Street and go right and you'll see it. Um, I'll go to the Freedom Center, uh, the Freedom Center. I go to the Freedom Tower, walk into the Oculus, and I go to the pools. Huge pools where the old or World Trade Center was. I would see that. I think that's important. Um, I do that. And if it's nice out, you have like walking shoes. You can walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, which is always a cool, fun, different thing to do. Most Instagramable spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things, especially if you're a New York City vlog. Freedom Tower, Central Park, walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. Like those are three things that you should do in the next ten hours. Okay. Fly nigh on does a uh, helicopter tour around the city with the doors open too. And it's like. Two hundred and fifty dollars per person, but you'll get the best shots you will you can even catch that last minute though. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Cool. Time. Cool. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. I have a hundred books to give out now. Yeah. Give them the clients. That's what everyone else is gonna do. <laughs> give them the clients. Give them your team members. How many people have done this? Way more. I don't know. Like a hundred or something. Oh really? I mean, it's like I do one of these now. It's like every two or three days, and I'm booked through the end of the year. I should have charged, I should have sold people like a thousand books. <laughs> I, I never thought anyone would do it. Like, it was almost like if you watch that video, the vlog where he put it out there, like Jordan was like, no one's gonna buy a hundred books just to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and and went. it's good, but a lot of people, a lot of people did it. No one did. I mean, I guess like, do you know what Gary does is buy a hundred books and you're like, you're crying. Yeah. Well, when I'm on my fifth book, then I can do that. <laughs>